our next guest used live streaming technology to take the music world by storm. He's not slowing down anytime soon. This is an interview you don't want to miss. You are now listening to the Music Business Dreams podcast, brought to you by KDMR Music. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Brandon. I'm your host of the Music Business Dreams podcast, and I want to thank you and welcome you to episode five. Uh, We've got a great show for you planned today. I spoke with music producer, beat maker, live streamer extraordinaire, Mr. Stolen Drums, and we talked about everything from how he got started in music, uh, his live streaming setup, uh, and basically his journey from being overseas and coming back to the States and no one knowing him to the top of Spotify charts. He was on the cover of a few Spotify playlists. He's really been doing it big in the last two years, and it all was accelerated when he decided to go live on a weekly basis. So we talked about all that. Before we get into the interview, I want to say again, thank you uh, for those who have come out and listened to the show. Uh, we're This is episode five, so we're about a month in. Uh, the show launched on the 4th of July, and we've had some major milestones since then. We've hit the top 50 on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcast charts. Uh, we've been syndicated on Spotify. So we're, we're really doing things uh, big, and it's all growing from word of mouth. This is just you guys telling people about it, sharing with your friends. And I'm appreciative of that. Uh, we're a small podcast, but we've got great things in store and great things planned. So I'm excited to keep sharing my personal network with you guys and helping you learn what it takes to succeed in the music business. So uh, with all that said, if you're new here, thanks for checking us out. Go ahead and subscribe. Uh, If you love the show, give us a rating, leave a comment, leave a review. All those things help other people see the podcast and we helps helps to build our community. So uh, all the links are in the show notes, or you can just go to musicbusinessdreams.com to find out how you can stay involved. So without further ado, here's my interview with Stolen Drums. All right, guys. So if you're familiar with the lo-fi hip-hop beat movement that's going on, then you're familiar with our next guest. Uh, His name is Stolen Drums, and his resume is really impressive. He's been uh, using live streaming and other social media techniques tactics, excuse me, uh, to gain his following. Um, He's averaging about 185,000 monthly listeners on streaming platforms and 50,000 views a month with his Beats and Chill uh, live streams. But welcome our next guest, Stolen Drums. How you doing, man? All right, man. How are you? I'm pretty good, man. Pretty good. So um, for those who don't know you, why don't you give a brief introduction to yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Stolen Drums. I am uh, what they call a progressive lo-fi producer. I just heard that term the other day. I thought it sounded cool. Um, but, yeah, the, the short version is I make beats in my tool shed, and I record them and put them on the Internet. Nice, nice. So how did you get started in music? Um, my music's been around for my entire life. Uh, my uncle had a record store when I was a little kid, and I, I kind of fell in love with it then. I started producing um, as soon as I was old enough to buy, you know, stuff to make beats with, and I've been at it ever since. Okay. So about how, about uh, when did you get started making beats? 2001, 2002. Wow. And so you've just been doing it consistently since then? On and off, man. Like, I, I started this whole stolen drums thing, like, maybe two years ago. Um, but previous to that, like I was, I was rapping for a little bit. I had like a little video game deal while I was doing that for a while. Um, and you know, various little beats here and there. I've mixed some records from time to time, but I didn't really take it serious, serious until like two years ago. Okay. So what was it that led to you taking it seriously? Was it just like some feedback that you'd gotten or just kind of a push? I took like a break from music for a bit. I was doing a lot of photography and video work. Um, for some friends of mine and for a bunch of different businesses and whatnot. And I, I got a gig. I traveled to Japan and um, I used to stay there. A friend of mine was there. We just kind of ran around for like a whole week making music, just hanging out. Um, like, you know, I, when I, when I lived there, that's kind of what we were on anyway. Mm. But going back there and kind of visiting homie and, and making new records and 
you know, and listening to all the stuff that all my friends were making. I, I had left Japan. I was gone for a while when I when I when I went back over. So just to kind of see everybody again, you know, touch base, it was super inspiring. And then when I came home, I was like, I gotta, I gotta get to work. Nice, nice. So I discovered you, or I found out about you, uh, just a little bit of, over a year ago, watching the Beats and Chill sessions on Facebook. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those came about and how your career has progressed through those? Yeah, for sure, man. Like, um, Beats and Chill was basically uh, a reaction to, to some text messages I was getting. I was sending out all these every day to my friends, like, via text message on the phone. I was sending them, like, waveforms on iMessage, and obviously waves take up a lot of space. So within right. a week or two, they were like, bro, chill. Like, don't send me no more music like this. Like, send me like a link or something or a video or something, but don't, don't just, don't wave files on my, on my iMessage. You're killing me. So, um, and as a reaction to that, I started recording videos, man. And then I, I found out about the Facebook Live stuff. It was relatively new at the time. Mm-hmm. I tried it and it, it kind of worked well. So based on that feedback, I just kept adding to the setup, like, you know, as a, videographer or whatever i just i was like how how far can i take it how make how good can i make it look how how good can i make it sound you know mm. um and that's pretty much been it from there okay cool so um talk about some of the things that you did to improve the look and the the sound of the live streams because they come across as very professional i mean the i can hear your voice i can hear the the instruments i can hear everything really clearly and usually you know with the facebook live it's it started as a mobile platform so people aren't really taking it that seriously so how are you able to achieve the the sounds yeah there's um there's a bunch of stuff happening at this point but i guess for the step by step i started with a phone i just had my my iphone i was playing music on the speakers and just talking to the camera um and then the first thing i did was like man i wonder if i can use my dslr so to kind of get the same effect and um i figured out through some software and a couple pieces of equipment like actually really not expensive stuff either but I figured out how to do that. And then once I got the camera I wanted, I was like, okay, cool. Well, if I got my, my, my Sony rig, then maybe I can set up my lighting. I set up some lighting. Then I figured out how to, like, you know, how to use the sound card I got in the computer to kind of record itself to an extent. Um, but, yeah, in the software I was using, I figured out how to loop the sound, basically, from the computer into that sound card, you know, and, and, and put that out live. So that was, like, another add-on, and it just kind of kept – it kept going from there. Uh, so now there's, like, sound card inception, bro. Like, I have, like, uh, a DJ mixer, the sound card, a regular sound card. Uh, I got my OBS set up. You know, it's all customized. I got custom uh, custom camera settings, like camera color profiles or whatever for the screen. Um, and, and obviously, like, the lighting's progressed, like, where it's actually built in now versus, you know, just having some lights on stands and stuff. But, yeah, man, like, it's... it's Every day I'm trying to add something else into it. I'm shopping now, trying to figure out how I can go anamorphic uh, live with a little on the camera. So, yeah, it's always something. Wow. So let's talk about, um, I guess, how the brand has grown from, you know, from when you started Beats and Chill to where you are now. Yeah, man. So there's been a lot of changes, man. Like um, Beats and Chill was, was freaking tremendous, man. I, I really appreciate it, you know, have an opportunity to be on Facebook Live when it kind of came out and you know, getting all the traction and the, the the push that the platform gave folks that were creating it at that time. Like, it helped a ton. Um, I kind of took that and parlayed it into what, what we call Controllerize, which is it was basically Beats and Chill multiplayer. Um, that kind of spun off and, and created this entire own business line. I didn't expect that. I, I just thought it was some stuff we were going to do on the weekend, but it ended up being a, a whole thing. Like, it's a part of my job, like probably 30% of my job at this point. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that grew legs. It, it did its own thing. We got a really dope team over there. Um, and then I, now I'm kind of circling back. It's interesting uh, that we, we keep referencing uh, the Beats and Chill joint because I really fell off for a long time, like, getting into the other things. I kind of progressed into other stuff. Uh, but now I'm kind of circling back, so it's kind of like Beats and Chill 2.0 time. Word. That's what's up, man. So I guess I should take a step back from all the business and um, ask you about your, your influences in music. Because your sound is really unique, but it seems like there's kind of a whole movement beyond 
just you. There's like a ton of other collectives and producers that are doing, you know, I guess what they've dubbed lo-fi. But again, your sound is still unique among all of that. Um, so what are your influences and kind of how do you how did you uh, acquire your style? Yeah, so, I mean, as a as a cat that's been making records for, for the amount of time I had, like, I'm an 80s baby, so, like, I came up in the 90s. And um, really, like, all I hear is, like, you know, like, Pete Rock and, 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 and Lars Pro and, and, and Notch and Dylan, all of those dudes are kind of the folks I looked up to you know, as, I was, I was, as I was creating my sound. Um, and I think a lot of his now are kind of looking at, like, you know, especially younger folks are looking at, like, the people on the Internet and, like, some of the L.A.B. scene heads, like, from, from this current generation, like, Knowledge of Mind Design. And I think those dudes are crazy dope, too. Mm-hmm. And, like, most of my influences came from, like, that, that like, you know, mid, late 90s. A couple of early 2000s cats, like, you know, like, oh, knowing them, and then uh, Black Milk and, and some other folks, too. But for the most part, it's, it was, like, you know, the OGs, like, Dilla and Quick and, you know, Large Pro and all them kind of cats. Right. So, I mean, your sound sounds like it's 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 well-studied, and it, it's come over a number of years. Um, can you talk about, like, the amount of practice that you've, you've had to do to be, kind of get where you are to find your your niche? Yeah, man, it's like I'm, I'm constantly telling folks, too, like, you know, if you're a creator in any kind of capacity, like, your best bet is just to create a couple thousand or whatever it is that you do. Um, and, yeah, that's pretty much, like, where my practice came from. I want to say I've probably lost, due to hard drive crashes, 5,000 records or something like that. Wow. Like, yeah, and, you know, my friends are in similar spaces. Most people that have been creating for, like, a decade or so will tell you, like, yeah, I probably lost a thousand songs. Um, but I think it takes that. It takes that, you know, that kind of consistent just sitting by yourself and creating until, like, it's, it's effortless. It's, it's just something that, that kind of happens, like breathing. So I know I know at one point you were working a full-time job, and I know you've got uh, – you've got – children so how are you able to get so many reps in while balancing all those other things as well i mean sometimes i don't um sometimes i gotta take some time off to get with my family um sometimes you know there is a because i'm in the studio too much it's, it's it's a balance man but when i when i work my full-time job what i what i would say um and so a lot of people that do work full-time jobs if you can give eight hours of your day away for money then you should be able to you know invest some of that same amount of time. Maybe you can't invest the whole eight hours, but invest two, one, four, whatever you can invest in yourself every day as well. If you're going to give eight hours to whoever you work for, make sure you give yourself a couple. I think like that consistency and just making it a habit, just like anything else, like working out or writing or, you know, whatever, cooking, um, skateboarding, any kind of, anything man like it just requires that that mindset you have to kind of get after it like there's no real way around it mm. okay so let's see you talked about earlier how you had taken a break for a few years from the music what what prompted that were you it's like at like a low point or yeah i came back from japan um it was right behind this little video game deal that i had i a little record deal and I had some, some clout where I was at. And um basically when when the company I was working for for my day job or whatever, when that kind of fell through, they lost the contract that they had. Everybody had to come back to the States. So when I came back to the States nobody knew me here. Um so I went to the radio stations and, and I tried to reestablish my situation. But mm-hmm. it was just a completely different market here, man, like in um it just didn't it didn't come across like it didn't work out like I wanted it to work out so I was like okay well this photography thing is cool I'll, I'll, I'll kind of focus on this for a bit and I kind of went that direction and that kind of did the same thing it grew legs really quickly I ended up touring and running around with a bunch of major artists and you know shooting stuff for magazines and you know freaking panels at festivals and stuff mm-hmm. but yeah that was that kind of took over my life man for like a good five years and then wow. um I had a stretch where, for whatever reason, I was in a weird spot. Like, I had 
you know, like this, 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 this happens too. Like you'll notice as a freelancer or an entrepreneur, you end up in like a middle ground sometimes. Like, so I, I had done hella work to get from like being an entry level kind of like, you know, pay me what you can pay me type of dude to where it was like, oh yeah, you just got off tour with Jeezy. And I saw you on stage with Estelle and you was at like Summer Jam in New York. And I just saw you at blah, blah, blah. And now you're on this panel at the, you know, Atlanta Film Festival and all of this stuff. I had a couple accolades and I was in the middle ground between like, you know, up and coming freelancer and like established uh, commercial guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, It's an interesting space to be in. And this is like, you got to kind of prepare for this. Like, but anyway, when it happened, I just came off tour, and all my old clients was like, bro, I don't want to pay the price. To deal with you, I got, you know, all these young cats that want to kind of just give me work for free or, you know, are willing to work at a very, very discounted rate to get their foot in the door. Meanwhile, you got, like, the, the OG rate, you know, but you're, you're not quite on a level that, you know, these other cats are that want to charge a similar rate. Mm-hmm. So it's like, but anyway, I had, like, a stretch, maybe a, a three to six months where I just didn't have a business. Uh, coming in that I wanted and I got offered this really cool job working for Google as an engineer. Um, So I took it. And, you know, once I took that job, I got out of photography. I had, like, I low-key had to sell my gear to go start working. Like, so once I hopped out of photography, then I was kind of free from that, then, you know, to kind of get into other spaces creatively. Um, And then that job, over time, like, it sent me back to... um, sent me back to Atlanta. Uh, I had actually moved for that job, but it sent me back to Atlanta. And once I got back here, I was like, oh, man, I can I can start making records again. I, you know, I got the opportunity. I went to Japan, like I said before, and I had the time, so I started working. Okay. So having that dual experience, you know, kind of making your name overseas and being in Japan for so long and then coming back from the States, um, can you talk about, like, the differences between the markets and some of the challenges in, you know, getting your work out in the States versus being overseas? Yeah, for sure, man. Like, in, being overseas, um, and I, 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 this is a good one, man, for anybody that's, like, you know, 20s or something, and they don't have, like, a whole lot of stuff kind of anchoring them to the States, so to speak. Um, I tell everybody, travel, go get overseas, man, because you're a commodity when you're not here. Um, plus, you get to learn so much about where we stay at by looking backwards. Versus, you know, like, you get that macro and micro view. Like, when you're here, you're inside the box. You got the micro view. And when you're away, you get that macro view. You can see everything kind of thing. Um, but anyway, yeah, Japan, um, Europe, pretty much every other country I've been to, uh, every other region, like, because I'm black, because I'm American, because I'm, you know, a representation of what hip-hop is, at least to those people, um, you become a commodity. And, you know, when you create as a commodity, then that, 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 that creation is more valuable. So it was a really easy for me to say, hey, you know, I'm the authentic hip-hop. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So when I show up as a rapper, and my references are all from the house, like from, from the States, and, you know, most of my friends are from the States, and, 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 and you know, all my validation comes from there, and you're in Japan, it's like, oh, okay, he's he's the real thing quote unquote. Um so it, it kinda put me in a, a situation. I I got spoiled to be honest with you because I could really kind of move around at will. Um uh, as long as you you got quality material, you can pretty much do what you want overseas. Um it just takes a little bit of networking. But yeah man, that's the biggest difference back here is saturate everybody's lip. So like nobody's trying to hear that you you sold a couple hundred thousand video games or whatever. Like nobody cares about that like that's not a big deal here. Coming back from there to Atlanta, it was like I came off a of, I came from from Japan like oh I just did two video game soundtracks I'm straight and then you know walking into um what was it? I forgot where where it was I had like my little presentation together and all of that and my press kit and I met um DJ DJ Toon he, uh, he at the time he was doing a bunch of stuff for Tip like Ti mm-hmm. and. I remember being so excited. I met this guy, gave him my records, talked to him, sent him the press kit and all of that. And um, I finally ran up on him at, at this show called For Sisters Only. We finally got a chance to meet. And I remember he, he took my material and sat on the table and walked up. I don't think he meant it in a way that like was dismissive, 
but it was crazy that like, you know, as, as excited as I was and as, as big a deal as I thought I was overseas here, I was normal. Like it was like, oh, everybody got a press kit, everybody got 15 records, everybody got radio plays, everybody's lit. So like, you know, unless you you're actually generating money, money on a regular basis, you're doing shows at this price, and you can show me BDS numbers that show me this. I can't do nothing with you. And it's not that I don't like your music. It just don't make sense business-wise. And I, once I, that was kind of like, that was heavy, man. So, you know, once that kind of hit, then I was like, man, I got to I gotta figure this out. And I started working and, 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 and doing other stuff, like with the photography and all of that. So, yeah. Wow. So that's interesting that you mentioned that as far as being a commodity overseas. I know that's a big part of the Roots' story. Like they went to Europe to do their first album and they, you know, had gotten some traction out there and then they came back to the States and it was just like no one knew who they were and they kind of ended up as this kind of alternative kind of sideshow type thing and never quite popped until, you know, that song with Erica Badu. But, um, and I used to work for Ninth Wonder and he talks about that as well as far as, you know, being out on the road and, you know, being a black artist, especially a hip hop artist, you know, you'll realize very quickly that your audience is mostly people that don't look like you. And so there's a lot to be said as far as, you know, people's appreciation of culture outside of their own. You know, I think it's it's kind of the same thing as how, you know, a lot of us in the beat making community, you know, we're, we're watching anime, you know, there's a lot of Japanese references, you know, some people are deeper into it than others, but it's just like, it's something different that we can identify with and because it's so different from us, then it's like when you see someone who also likes it, you it's like an instant kinship. And so I think that's it's really interesting. It's like a cultural study. It's like how we just latch on to things that are outside of our own culture and then kind of, you know, on the I guess the negative side of that is, you know, how certain things and certain art forms get quote unquote taken from us, you know like the biggest R&B stars don't look like us and jazz music largely doesn't look like us. How do you maintain like a balance between your sense of self, but then also realizing that you don't just belong to you and people who look like you? Yeah, that's a crazy deep question. That's awesome. Um, it's at this point, I really don't too much, how you say? I don't. I don't put a whole lot of stock in in trying to be a good representation of a race or a group of people at this point. Like for me, your best bet is just to try and be the best person you can be in general. Like be the best man you can be, be the best woman you can be, um, and be a good example for like just be the person you would want your kids to be. You know what I mean? That and that's that's kind of my my take on on everything at this point. Um, so I'm more focused on that than I am focused on anything else. But I think by proxy you kind of take off all the other boxes in doing so. Like if you if you if you're just trying to set that a good example for yourself, like you know if you're trying to say like when I wake up tomorrow or when I go to bed tonight, I just want to be like man, you crushed, but like you did what you were supposed to do. Like you know what I mean? Right. Like if, you, if you're in that mind space, like you're cool. Like in general, um, regardless of, of of the cultural circumstance or of the cultural you know influence or you know whatever the situation may be but at the same time it is interesting man to see um you know folks kind of appropriate for lack of a better term i know we use that shit a lot we everybody says appropriation um i have a hard time with it with, with that because like you know, we sample records, man. We sample soul records from all these other different places and we make new sound out of them. So somebody be like, yo, you're appropriating this or you're appropriating that is, is, is a tough one if you make sample records, bro, because are we not appropriating, you know, whatever records that we're sampling? Is that not a, the same thing? Like, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, uh, but yeah, and I'm, I'm digressing, but I always thought that was interesting, man. Like it, it's an interesting dynamic, like, but for sure, like, the people that make the most money don't look like us, and we definitely created the music in the first place. That happened, for sure. Um, does the marketplace look like us? You know what I mean? Not, not necessarily. Yeah, it's so like, is the money that they're making, like, is the money coming from us, are they generating all of that? You know what I mean? Like, if you say, like, man, because it becomes a black and white debate. Like, if you say, like, all right, bro, 
you know, black artists created this art form, hip hop, and then white people stole it, is what I hear a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, like, now that the white people stole it, they're making all the money off of it. They appropriated it. And then the question becomes, well, who's purchasing? I was like, man, well, all right, well, it's split. Like, and maybe we need to do some research and figure it out. This is kind of interesting, actually. It's an interesting train of thought. I wonder, like, if the metrics from listeners and buyers of music reflect the, the people who are popular in the music genre. Are we just seeing the people who consume the music, you know, resonating with someone that looks like them? Is that what's happening? Or is it some kind of malicious intent? You know what I mean? Right. And yeah, I don't I don't know that it's malicious as much as it was, you know, like back in the sixties when say like, you know, you had Pat Boone and everybody covering Little Richard records. But yeah, that's, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Right. That's a different thing. But it's like if I'm just like a mom shopping at Walmart or FYE or wherever you get music, right, in Oregon, am I gonna pick up a Jay Z album or am I gonna pick up an Eminem album for my kid? who looks a lot like Eminem, you You know? know, So it's it's like, I mean, if you look at just population statistics, I mean, black people, I mean, at one point we were 13% of the population. I think it's a little bit less now with like the influx of Hispanics and other uh, immigrants, but white people are like 80% of the population. So, and we know that in order to go platinum, to sell a million records, you know, it's likely not a million black people buying your product, right? Like in order to, to see that height of mainstream success, it's not just people that look like you that are buying it. That's so, for sure. so on the flip side of that, you know, if you're white and most of the buying audience is white anyway, then is it really appropriation or are you just benefiting from, you know, being white? I guess either way, it's kind of, it can be problematic depending on who you're talking to, right? I don't think these issues really matter much in the grand scheme of things when you're talking about like, you know, racism or like, let's say if you compare it to something like police brutality, but I mean, it's, I guess they're all kind of offshoots of similar concepts. And this, this conversation got really deep out of nowhere. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, man. So that's, that's an interesting study. Somebody, somebody has got to look into that more. Yeah, man. I agree. Like, I, I think it's crazy. Like, you know, like I, I, I'm friends. I, I like to say I'm friends with a lot of, of really, you know, exceptional producers. Um, the majority of them look like myself. Um, but I noticed that, like, and it's, it's just by circumstance. I don't know what the situation is, but like we kind of come from the same generation, uh, so we're around the same age or whatever. And I'm, I'm talking to these folks. And, and some of them, you know, figured it out. They they got their 2018 game plan down or whatever. And then some of them are more like, kind of like they 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 had their moment. Not, I don't even want to say that. They're crazy. They're like geniuses. They're not. They didn't have their moment. They're having their moment. But you know, like they came around and they started to really pop before the internet stuff happened. But these are like L A B C O G S. Like, you know what I mean? They just mm-hmm. they kind of. It's just by circumstance, they just, they're just they just older, right? So they came out before like Spotify had playlists and all this other stuff. So, like, their, you know, their name is good on the street level. Their name is good per city by city. Their name is good for, like, the people who really live inside the culture. Like, you know, their name is good with people like myself. But for most of the commercial heads, the chill hot people, the – the the Spotify playlisters, folks like oh I don't want to say playlisters because it's like some of the playlisters are hella knowledgeable. That's that's not that's a, neither here nor there, there. But some of the people that you know that listen to Spotify, a lot of the people anyway, like they don't know these guys. These guys are like the pillars though. For me, they're like the living OGs, like like Knotts and and Dibiase and and all these other heads. Like in that space, are kind of like to me like you know, what Dilla would be if he was still running around. You know what I mean? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not doing, like, if you look on those platforms, like the SoundClouds and the Spotify's and, and all of that, they're not doing the same numbers that my 17-year-old freaking white dude that's in the collective is doing. He's crushing. He just hit 10 million streams, and I think he had 3 million at the start of the year, so he did 6 million this year. You know what I mean? Right. 
I had another cat that started making beats maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago at this point. But he's like, yeah, man, I was on Hype Machine four times. I just hired my publicist. You know what I mean? Mm. So, like, it's interesting, man. Like, it's, it's a weird it's a weird thing to see. But I don't think it has anything to do with their race. So I mean, it, it does, for sure, because they look like they look. And when they, you know, they put pictures up on Instagram, they look like they look. Um, and that is what it is. But, like, their skill level, they're, they're, they're decent at what they do. I honestly... You know, like they're not they're not Dibiase because Dibiase been making records since the '90s. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and this dude is like, yeah, he's making beats on calculators that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to do something similar in Ableton. Like, and he's on a freaking eighty dollar, you know, little calculator thing from. But anyway, I digress. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see that man. I'm like, damn, Dibiase been putting in work for. 20 years or whoever I, I use him I'm, I'm not trying to you know use you know OD and use him as an example too much but like you know you got somebody in that calendar that's, that's been making records for 20 years or something like that and then you got a 17 year old kid that's been making records for 20 minutes and you know the 20 minutes dude got 50 million plays and the OG don't and I'm trying to understand how this dynamic works but what you realize is it's not about that shit like it's not about who's doing what number. It's not about what anybody else is doing. It's 100% about what you're doing. You know what right. I mean? It's each right. individual case is individual. Like, your network is your network. Their network is their network. Like, if you if you start looking at other folks' pockets, like, it gets out of hand. Like, you know, that's that's how jealousy and all this other stuff come in. Like, you got to stay your course and work your space, like, and, and do what you're supposed to do. You got to do you at the end of the day. Um, right. So, like, if you're, if you're making a living, if you're having a positive influence on other people's lives, in any capacity, you're doing the right thing. You know what I mean? And if you're able to, to maintain existence, like, if you can exist and pay your bills and, and everything else, you're good, man. That's, like, that's it. That's all there really is to it. Like, I can feed my kids and pay my mortgage. I'm lit. I don't, I don't really need a whole lot else, man. To be honest with you, I don't need a million Virginian plays. I don't need, like, crazy cars and none of that. I just want to... My family's straight, and I got a little bit of money in the bank, so that way when the mortgage comes, I can pay it, or if something happens, I can take care of it. I'm straight. I don't need nothing else. That's really my end game, to be honest with you. Right. And so with that being said, can we talk about some of the ways that you've been able to uh, monetize what you've been doing so that you are able to pay your bills? Yeah, man. Um, I've been, like, experimenting with different products and, and, and different ways to, to monetize pretty much since the start, so... Um, the most recent thing I did was a drum kit, which was the most successful product I've ever launched. And I, I kind of, I'm kicking myself. I'm like, damn, I should have been launching drum kits for sure, like a while ago. But um, I did a class for a while. Uh, that went pretty well. Beat Builders Workshop is what I called it. I made it a subscription-based thing, and it was a reoccurring uh, series of classes. And it was dope. I kind of ran out of things to teach, and I think I'm going to republish that in 4K. I did a live stream. I would just hop on live stream and, and show people how to do different things once a week. And it was pretty dope for a couple months, but then very quickly it was like, damn, I don't really know what else to teach people how to do. So because I think the, the skill set is, 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 is not limited. It's, um, it's finite. It's, it's, I don't really have like an infinite amount of things to teach our classes on, you know? All right. So I feel like if I take those hour classes and make them beautiful 4K, <laughs> Light them perfect, edit them perfect, color grade them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think they're they're more valuable product that way. Um, and then they can kind of they live forever. They call it evergreen. Right. Um, but basically, if you've never seen it, then it's new for you. Um, so that's going to be that, and it'll be one single price. But that would be Builders Workshop. Um, I had Stolen Drum Society. Stolen Drum Society was basically me taking super super rare records. Like I had some friends send me records from Japan and. Some folks from South America sent me some stuff, and I was sourcing things from, like, France. And Anyway, I was taking these records, and I would take those, and um, and I would digitize them and send them uh, to the homies. Like, to anybody that was in the club, everybody just paid membership to be in the club, and I shared my record collection, basically. Mm. Uh, at least the best stuff I could find in it, and I would share those. Um, I did that for a while. That felt a little weird because I felt like I was kind of pirating music or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's a little gray area. I'm not trying to get hemmed up on a goofy, you know, this dude pirated some old record. Because, like, one person, I was like, I'm cool. So I let that go. 
Um, but that was also pretty cool. Uh, and then the most recent thing, like I said, was that drum kit, man. That drum kit thing was amazing. I'm glad I did that. That was a really good experience. The community really fast. I, and it makes sense. Like, obviously, we're all producers, so to drop a drum, some, some drums is dope. Uh, but, yeah, that, Spotify, obviously, has been paying uh, a good chunk of my bills for a long time. Shout out to Spotify. Appreciate y'all. Um, and I had, like, actual shows. And then I spun up Controller Rise and started doing two local shows a week. So I got, like, two residencies, basically, in the city. Um, yeah, man, that's in a nutshell. That's pretty much what I've been up to. Started doing some consulting work here and there. But, you know, for the most part, I've just been I've been working the shows and, and just putting up new music, new content. Nice, man. So that's that's something I tell, you know, our listeners and people that I coach a lot. It's just about... You know, there's there's lots of ways to make a living, you know, as a musician, but you've got to be diverse in your income streams. And it seems like you've taken that concept and completely run with it. Yeah, yeah. And I had a friend of mine told me, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a millionaire that doesn't have at least five different revenue sources. Mm. And I kind of took that to heart. I'm like, man, okay, well, I'm going to set up five revenue streams. I'm like three in right now, but I'm trying to, you know, five makes sense. I get it. I understand how, how like there was a story about a guy. He 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 was a multi millionaire, almost a billionaire, he was fifty years old. And I said, What do you do? And they these people expect a singular answer. He said, I own like twelve different businesses. They were like, What kind of businesses? Oh, I got three laundry uh, you know, laundry spots, laundry mats, three of those, I got a gas station, I got a convenience store. And I mean, it's all little stuff like that, and they all added up to where this dude's, you know, now generating a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. But none of the business lines by themselves make over twenty thirty. It's just mm. the combination of them all. You know, he set up management and and everything else he needed to set in place to where all the business lines run themselves for the most part. He just checks in on them. But yeah, that's I think that's how you do it. I don't I don't you know if you're trying to make a million dollars off of one thing. I think like media has probably affected you, and that's what it looks like on TV. But even the dudes like even Jay Z got multiple business lines, bro. Like he's buying art and real estate, and investing in tech, and doing everything else he can do to diversify his revenue. He can stop rapping tomorrow and be rich forever because of everything else. Rap helped, I'm sure, but it's not everything. And I think a lot of folks get that confused. It's important, man. You gotta you gotta have a couple streams of revenue. Definitely. So through all this, we haven't even talked about, you know, some of the, excuse me, the crazier things that have kind of gone on in the last year since you really started being consistent and uploading things to Spotify and stuff like that. Like you've, you've rocked stadiums. I saw you on the cover of a playlist. Um, you know, the Controller Eyes Collective has grown. Um, how have you gone about, you know, getting some of these partnerships and these, these, these brand um collaborations that you've got going in this, these most recent months? It's been a lot of really cool people doing a lot of really cool stuff. I'm, I'm really just making beats, bro. Uh, I'll be honest with you. And I, I try and present myself somewhat professionally, but most of it's been like a really cool person at Spotify was like, hey, I listen to your stuff. Um, you're in a bunch of playlists. You just drop a new record. You put your face on the cover of this lo-fi playlist. I was like, yes, yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. Let's do that. So they did. Um, the cats from Roland hit me and was like, hey, we're coming to Atlanta. We'd love to do a collab show with somebody from there that used the equipment. You guys obviously use the equipment. There's a ton of you guys. I see hella content online. But why not collab? And that was the beginning of that. Um, shout out to L.A. People in L.A. looked out. Shout out to House Shoes and DVIC and Daddy Kev over there. Low end theory, um, and a uh, homie Mike over there at uh, Beat Cinema. But everybody looked out, man. And um, it was just been a, a lot of really cool people just kind of putting things together. But the Low End Theory show helped a lot. Uh, How she was looking out for me helped a lot. The EVIC looking out helped a lot. Um, the folks at Beat Cinema, man, they, they looked out crazy. Uh, Serato, uh, it was just some really cool people at Serato. You know, kind of saw everything, heard everything or whatever. I guess they, they found me some way. And, you know, they gave me some stuff. Uh, we ended up doing some content together. There's some more content coming soon. Like, it's just been 
really cool people. Even streaming online, man, like um, Boston Chill Hop is, is an OG. Like, they, they, he's young, bro, but he's been doing what he's been doing for like 10 years. He's a freaking genius, low-key. Mm-hmm. Um, but same thing, like he saw me early on. It was just like, hey, you're cool. Why don't you do some stuff for the platform? And we did a collaboration, and it just, you know, it helped. And all that stuff helps, man. If people want to collab, collab. Like, if, if you know, uh, that's kind of how it works. But really, like, I haven't gone out and, and, and tried so much of this stuff. Uh, it's been just by circumstance. Like, somebody was in network, or they just found me, and, and, you know, they thought it would be cool to collaborate. The crazy thing is, like, the stuff that I've tried to get done, like, I don't know, but there's a big thing on social. It wasn't big, but there's, at a time I was campaigning, trying to get, like, a machine uh, Mark III from Native Instruments. I was mm-hmm. trying to get them to send me one so hard, bro. But they never sent, like, I, I could never get it done. I just couldn't figure out how to do it. I met some people over there. We sat down. But that, I just couldn't get that piece of gear. And I, I really wanted one. But I was like, man, you know, I feel like it would be just like an ego, not even ego, but it would be like a really cool thing for them to send me one. Like I would feel right. like, yeah, I, I did the work. You know, they sent me one type of thing, which is, you know, it's neither here nor there. But, like, I couldn't get it done. But everything else happened, like, so quick. It was instant. Like, yeah, But it was because, like, you know, somebody saw it, saw what I was doing and was interested in what I was up to versus, you know, me reaching out to them trying to make something happen. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I had, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the last episode um, of the podcast was Sarah the Instrumentalist. And she's been, you know, on YouTube about as long as you've been doing the live streams, about two years now. And she was telling me how, you know, she's got a friend who was doing like tech videos on YouTube. And she grew her channel just by kind of getting some tips from her. And she just started doing these pitch emails. And so, she got like the, the little calculator thing uh, from Teenage Engineering. And then she's just been consistently reaching out to brands since then. And she's like, you know, not everyone says yes. Um, but, you know, if they say no, you're just, you know, you just end up where you were before you asked. So it's not, there's really no loss. Um, but she talked about how once she started working with brands, other brands noticed and now they reach out to her. And that sounds like a lot of what you've got going on as well, like where people just, People find out about you, right, whether it's because the Facebook algorithm is pushing your stuff to the front, whether someone tells them about you or whatever. But then on the back end, like, you know, like you said, you present yourself professionally. So things look and, you know, they are in order to the point where someone your your information was easily accessible. Like, I mean, I don't know you personally, but it was it was easy for me to reach out for this interview and I think that's the key that a lot of artists don't don't know. Like they don't have their website set up. They're not responsive when you email them because they set up their email to be somewhere where they only check it like once a week or, you know, and it's like they're not consistently on social media. With social media, it's like the the key to being successful is being consistent because like the more you post, the more people engage with you, the more the platform will show you to other people outside of just whoever may be following you at the time. Yep. Yeah. I 100% agree with that, man. 100%. Like, it's, it, it, I guess it all comes back to being, you know, consistent and, and and just trying to drive your level of quality up, regardless, by just incrementally, day in and day out, being better than you were the day before. Mm-hmm. At, at the end of the day, is what it comes down to. Okay. So throughout your journey, what's been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? Um, the biggest challenge, I, honestly, is that is that whole work life balance thing. Um, and it's like not something that I talked about a whole bunch, but for sure, like I had hella struggles with that man, like working full time and and trying to build some kind of music career and you know all this other stuff. Like it's hard. Like that's that's not easy, man. And then trying to you know be a good dad. And a good husband and, and, and just a good person in general, good friends, my friends and all that. Like that's, it's, it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to fit all of that um, in a day, day in and day out. So it became like, you know, today I'm going to do this and tomorrow I'm going to do that. And it's, it's a challenging thing to keep, you know, consistent. I'll be honest, it's probably my biggest challenge is, is finding work-life. 
life balance. So, like, it has the appearance of, of manic depressive online because, like, I'll exist and I'll do a bunch of stuff for a stretch and then I'll just kind of disappear for a bit and, and hang out with my family and live real life, so to speak. And right. Come back. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's probably been my biggest challenge, man. Gotcha. I feel like that's that challenge may be compounded because so much of what you do has that live streaming aspect to it. So it's like you have to be present. Whereas, like, for example, for this podcast episode won't come out for like another three or four weeks. Right. And I try to interview people, you know, in blocks. So it's like, look, I'm, I'm doing interviews on the 14th. I'm doing interviews on August 4th. Like whoever can fit in those days, that's who's going to be on the podcast for the next month or the next six weeks or so. Right. So for me, I've been able to kind of find that balance by just saying to my wife, look, this day I'm unavailable and this day I'm unavailable, but I've got you for like the rest of the week. Because if I got, if I can put all of my effort into getting these tasks done these two days, then that sets us straight for like the next six to eight weeks. Um, have you been able to kind of batch or automate any of the, your processes for any of that type of stuff? To an extent, man, for the most part, um, the the live streaming stuff that I'm doing is like a big part of it is to avoid like the vocal process, the editing process. I'm you know, trying to free up as much time as I can, basically. I'm trying to be able to say, like, okay, I'm going to do this live stream for an hour and it's going to take an hour to set up. And that's two hours of my time. I'm going to do it, but when I do it, when I push stop, it's up. I'm done. Right. You know what I mean? Now I can go, you know, facilitate, do other stuff. I can go hang out with my family or do whatever it is. Um, that, that honestly, is the easiest thing for me for content. Like, creating content for, like, Beats and Chill or creating content for Controller Eyes is probably, like, one of the more simple things that happen. But it's like, you know, drawing up flyers or creating video content for something that's long-term that has to be of a different kind of quality or that requires editing or requires, like, multiple day shooting stuff like that that's that's the hard stuff for me mm. uh, live stream stuff is clutch i love that like that's i'm like man i can use restream i'm up on four like four platforms you know when i'm done like you know it's up it's up now like y'all want to see what happened last saturday night just it's up it was up, it was up on saturday night like that's beautiful to me i love that that is dope so it sounds like live stream is definitely your your weapon of choice it helps, man. It helps a lot because um, the, the 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 caveat for the live stream stuff is like the algorithm doesn't look at it the same way it looks at native video. So if I upload a four hour native video, it's going to get you know x amount of push from whatever platform you know. Like especially YouTube, like YouTube definitely values long form video content more than it values live stream content. Like there's a huge disparity. I put up a live streaming video, it might get a couple hundred views, maybe a thousand. If I put up a long form mix, it's going to get thousands of views. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing happens on Facebook, where now, at first, the algorithm was like live stream everything. That's what we want you to see. If you do a live stream for two hours, you put that up, we love you. Um, now it's a little, it's, I think the video content has kind of crept back, uh, you know, a little bit higher uh, than what live streaming was. So now it's like that long form video content, man. It's it's, it's kind of the thing, um, which is honestly pushing me to want to pre-record mixes versus just doing a live stream version of them um, and see how that goes. Uh, that may be like an experiment I'm into in the next couple uh, in the next couple weeks, but I, I'm trying to find a way to do it uh, in a way that is efficient. So um, I'm working on this too. Got you, got you. So what's next for you, man? So next. Uh, next project for me, I want to, there's a couple things. Uh, there's a couple startups I'm working on, business side, away from music, uh, that are really cool that we're going to paperwork for. As soon as I get all my paperwork together, I can talk about those cool. Let's look for those, uh, even though I can't say much. <laughs> uh, and then I'm working on a documentary, uh, that I want to document kind of lo-fi culture. Uh, this is another thing that's in the works that I can't talk a whole bunch about. But, uh, in short, basically, uh, Anthony Bourdain's No Reservation, but for producers. So mm. influences from culture, influences from location, um, obviously musical influences, but it's, you know, kind of linking up with the different people and the different dynamics and talking about that. Like, I want to go hang out and talk to the 17-year-old beat makers 
They don't look nothing like me that are multi-millionaires. I want to talk to them and, and hang out with them and see what their process is like and see what they're up to. I want to talk to the OGs and, and, and you know, talk to LA Beast and see what they're up to. And I want to go talk to people in Japan and China and Germany and kind of all over the world in the same way um, and just kind of see what it's like on their side. I think it's interesting that uh, I think the other people think it's interesting as well. So that's kind of the next big thing for me. Uh, obviously, you know, still releasing music on a regular basis. This is the first time, like, this, I got a new project I'm working on called Slaps that I was supposed to drop, like, two weeks ago, but I keep adding stuff to. Um, <laughs> this is bad. It's a cycle, man. But this is the first time I've ever released a project that nobody's ever heard before, which is pretty cool. So I'm excited about that. Um, nobody's ever heard 90% of it. Like, there's a couple here and there you can find stuff, but... It's usually, like, in the background of, like, a controllerized bump or something like that. That is kind of hard to, you know, you're really not, it's not on SoundCloud like that. So uh, it'd be out everywhere uh, within the next couple weeks or whatever. But that I'm really excited about. There's some content. There's uh, some additional content coming with uh, some of the folks that I was working with, some of the bigger companies. Um, we're ironing the kinks out. Well, we're good. Everybody's in agreement. We're creating the content now, so finish that up and I can talk about it, but that's pretty cool. That'd be like the biggest um, corporate project I've ever done, like corporate partnership type of project I've ever done. Mm-hmm. Look for that. That's that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, man, I'm working every day. Control Rise 2.0 just launched. We got a new spot. Um, really excited about that. We got this thing we do on the weekends called Press Start. It's a video game base, which kind of like really created our own little e-league in Atlanta off the, you know, off the muscle. <laughs> yeah, so that was cool. But it's like, you know, every day is something new, man. Like, um, there's a bunch of stuff. Just, I guess they tuned in if, if you want to see what's good on this side. That's what's up, man. So where can they tune in at? Uh, StolenDrums.com. Uh, I spell my name hella funny, but it's basically Stolen Drums, no vowels, no spaces. Um, and all over social media, music, et cetera, it's all the same. Uh, it's all just all the same way on everything. This is another major key. If you're an artist, like, find your domain. Name it everywhere. There's a website called Name Checker, man. Like, don't do, the, like, the one, two, three, underscore, backslash thing. It's hard. It's hard to follow up with. Right. <laughs> I, I, people do that all the time, though. But, yeah, so, yeah, man, stay locked in. And, you know, appreciate the, the look, man. Appreciate you having me. Oh, no problem, man. I appreciate you being on the show. Um, so with that, I know you've got three things you want to take us out with. Yeah, man. As always, man, three things. Number one, life is good. Number two, time is precious. Number three, make somebody smile because that's how the wavy. That's it, man. Be safe. Now that's what's up, man. Thanks again to Stolen Drums for such an insightful, amazing interview. There were so many tips packed in there that you guys can take home and use. I really encourage you. Something that I took away from the conversation was just using the platforms that are available to you. Um, Stolen Drums basically communicated that he, he kind of felt like he may have gotten lucky in a way, uh, whereas he got you know, caught up and he got propelled by the Facebook algorithm because live streaming was new when he was doing it. So he benefited from them really pushing live content. But another tip was to be consistent and always be prepared because you never know what's going to go viral. You never know what's going to catch. So it's best to have your website set up, have your socials set up, have the most professional image you can so that when an opportunity presents itself, you're ready for it. Always be practicing. Always get those reps in. As Drake would say, keep shooting in the gym. Uh, but that's enough for today. I'm Again, I'm really grateful. If you stayed the whole time, you're a trooper because we're about 55 minutes in. Thank you for listening to us talk for an hour. I'll see you next week when we're talking to mix engineer Brian Kidd.